my name's Durham. Um, I'm on the source control team at Facebook, and I'm going to talk about what we've done to make our source control scale as our repositories have gotten bigger and bigger. In particular, a few of the open source projects that we've done in order to help this happen, all of which are available now. Uh, before I get started, who here has used Subversion? Raise it, show of hands. Everyone? All right, Git? Everyone? All right, cool. Mercurio? Not everyone? All right, this will be fun. So before I get into what we've done, you kind of have to understand why we have a problem. And we have a problem because our repo is big. We've got hundreds of thousands of files, and that number is constantly growing. We've got thousands of commits each day, and we've had this for years. So our repo is pretty damn big. And when we extrapolated forward what our repo would look like and will our source control tool scale, we found that our existing tools are not going to scale as our repo gets bigger. Okay, So what we did, uh, to give you some context, a few years back we used Subversion. And that scales pretty well, but it's not really fun to use. I don't think anyone's ever told me they love Subversion. Uh, so we've used, we went to Git. And Git's quite good, but as our repository got even bigger, even that started to fail. And we extrapolated forward. We found that things like status, fetch, rebase, all of those things would come grinding to a halt and would impede our developers' efficiency. So we looked at it and said, how can we fix this? And unfortunately, what we determined was in order to fix Git to scale like we needed it, we would actually have to fork it. And that's not something we're really interested in doing. So we looked around, and we actually decided to go with Mercurial. Okay. So Mercurial is a fast distributed version control system. Distributed means it's basically the same as Git. You have your local commits. You download an entire copy. You have local branches. You can push and pull between peers. Exactly the same in all those philosophies. Okay. But the key difference is it's in Python. So we're able to easily hack on it, easily extend it. And it even has an extensibility API. So we can do all of these extensions that we want to do and make it scale without forking. So that's what we're doing. We're making Mercurial scale. And over the past two years, we've contributed over 500 patches upstream, addressing things like uh, scale, performance, robustness, uh, adding new features that we need. So we've been contributing back. Um, and it, in addition, we've made a few extensions that go even beyond what core Mercurial is uh, capable of. And we'll talk about a few of those. Um, so anyways, problem one, hundreds of thousands of files, like I said before. This is a problem because when you have that many files, checking them is expensive. You do something like HG status, which tells you which files you've changed in your repository, and it has to go through every single one and say, did you change, did you change, did you change? And that actually takes a while. The other issue, which is probably relevant to you guys, is builds can take a while. When you do an incremental build, it has to look at all those files and determine which files have changed, which build steps do I need to run, or which projects do I need to build. And on a hot file cache, this can take several seconds. And as our repository gets bigger, it'll be more than several seconds. And on a cold file cache, this can take minutes, especially if your machine just rebooted and is doing a lot of stuff. So this is a problem. This is slowing down our developers. So what we thought is, instead of checking every file, why don't we just monitor it as it goes? And that way, when we have the question, the answer is immediately available. And so that's what we did. We built a project called Watchman. It's available on GitHub. It's a cross-platform file monitoring solution. Okay, so what it does is it watches a directory tree and watches for all the changes that your users or your automation makes to files in that directory tree. And it answers the question, which files have changed? And more importantly, it does it quickly, usually in milliseconds. Okay? So no matter how many files you have, you have an answer and you have it quickly. Okay? Now, some of you may be familiar with existing file monitoring solutions. Linux has iNotify. Mac has FS events. They are a pain in the butt to use. If any of you have tried, you know what I'm talking about. They're complex, they're not user friendly, and they have a lot of race conditions that you have to be aware of as the developer. So what we did is we solved most of that for you. We've made Watchman robust and easy to use. We actually do use the operating systems underlying uh, file monitoring stuff, like iNotify and FS events, but we provide a simple interface so that it's easy for you to use, and we hide all of the complexity and race conditions. And more importantly, because this is a really hard problem to solve, if you've tried, we've extensively tested it. So for instance, when we first developed this, we rolled it out for several months to all of our developers. And every time they did an HG status or an ARC bu uh, build or anything like that, we looked at what, is, what does it think the result is and what does Watchman think the result is. Like what's actually on disk, what does Watchman think is on disk. And we compared it, and when we found discrepancies, we fixed it. And we did this for several months. And now we've had Watchman rolled out for even more months on production servers, and it's been working great. So to give you an idea of how simple it is to use, this is the actual code you'd have to use to use it. All you have to do is tell Watchman, watch that directory, and it begins watching it and keeping track of changes. When you want to know what's changed, you say Watchman sense the directory you're interested in, um, and then a token. The token's just a string you choose. It lets, you, it lets Watchman know who you are, so that the next time you ask, it can show you only the new things that have changed. So in this first example, it just returns JSON, very easy to parse for your tooling. It says files, none. It's an array. 
It's empty, nothing has changed. So I go and touch file bar, and then I ask again, what has changed? And now you see the file array has one file in it called bar. It also returns things like the size, the m time, the mode, all the information you'd normally get from the disk, Watchman provides without hitting the disk and does it very quickly. In addition to telling you what files have changed recently, you can add subscriptions for events. So if a user changes like a CSS file, we can add a trigger that whenever a CSS file changes within that directory tree, we can run minify on that CSS file. And this can be extrapolated even further for any sort of background builds you want to do or background static analysis. So this is very powerful. And as, uh, as we've had Watchmen out there, more and more teams at Facebook have started to uh, utilize this functionality. It's very powerful. So where do we use it? Most of our incremental builds at Facebook use this. They don't look at the file system. They ask Watchmen what has changed, and they get an answer quickly. In addition, we use it for many of our background builds. We use it for identifying which build steps we need to do, which projects need to be built. We do it for static analysis. We even uh, background index the source code as the user's changing it, all based on these events. Okay. And we use it in source control. Okay. So we have integrated it with Mercurial. And the way we've done that is through an extension called HG Watchman. So HG is the command line interface for Mercurial. HG is the symbol, chemical symbol for Mercury. So it makes sense, easy to type. And HG Watchman is the open source extension that integrates Watchman and Mercurial. Okay. To give you an idea, or, so what it does is it replaces the implementation of HG status to instead of looking at the disk, it talks to Watchman and it gets the answer quickly. And to give you an idea of how much that affects it, this red bar on the right, that's our old HG status time. The green bar is HG Watchman. It's five times faster. In a few years, when our number of files have increased, that red bar is going to start heading towards the sky. And most importantly, that green bar is basically constant time. So as our repository grows bigger and bigger, we no longer have to care about it. HG Watchman answers the question for us. Okay, so it's very powerful. In addition, most Mercurial commands care about what files have changed on disk. So this actually provides a benefit almost across the board. Okay, so status is five times faster. Diff is three times faster. Checkout and commits, all of them gain benefits from not having to look at the disk anymore. Okay, so it's useful across the board. And just like Watchman, it's very easy to set up. So if you have Watchman already installed, you just clone it, you build it with make, and you set it in your HGRC. That's the config file for Mercurial. You enable it, turn it on, and it takes care of the rest. Suddenly, Mercurial's faster. So this helps, the combination of these two extensions has helped solve the problem of too many files. And it's proven useful in a wide variety of our build tools and a wide variety of our developer tools. But it doesn't solve the problem of our repos huge. So that's problem two. We have a large and quickly growing repository. And this is an issue because large repos are slow. When you have 1,000 commits going in every day, if a user waits a day between pulls, that's a lot of commits to pull. If they wait a week, that's a heck of a lot of commits to pull. And if they go on paternity leave, well, they might as well just not come back. Okay? <laughs> it also means checkouts are slow, because so many files are changing each day. Um, when you pull and then check out to a new, uh, newer version of the code, it takes a while, because there's a lot of files. We've been doing this for years, so our history is huge. So that means clones are slow, because whenever you clone, you have to download all of this history. And in addition, it requires a lot of disk space. And all of these are relevant to your developer's efficiency, but they're also relevant to your build infrastructure, because your builds are doing these exact steps. They're cloning, they're pulling, they're doing all this stuff. They're using disk space like nobody's business. So this, is effect this affects all of us. So what did we do? Well, before I can tell you that, we kind of have to understand how Mercurial stores its data. So Mercurial stores its data in a bunch of files behind the scenes that you don't normally see. That blue one on the left, Left? Yes, left. That's the change log. That's a list of all the commits you've ever made. So that's things like the author, the description, the time. It's none of the data. It's just the metadata. Okay, so it's fairly small, and it has every commit you've ever made. Now, for every file in the repository, there's a thing called a file log, and that's each of these red columns. So for instance, index.php, there's a file log that contains every version of that file that you've ever had, in this case, three of them. And every file has one of these. Okay? And when you clone, you have to download every bit of that to the client. And that takes a while. So what we thought is most users, they don't care about the history. They don't need the stuff that happened in 2008. They barely need the stuff that happened a month ago. So we're just not going to download all that. Okay? So when, at, at Facebook, how we clone right now is we only download that change log, only the commit metadata. And then when a user checks out to a particular commit, we download exactly what they need. So in this case, the user checked out to the latest commit. We only download, downloaded the latest version of each of those files. Okay, so this saves us a lot of time in downloading. It saves a lot of effort. 
and it's generally been performant. The extension we use to do this is called Remote File Off. It's open source, it's on Bitbucket, and what it does is it changes Mercurial to leave file contents on the server, just like I showed you before. In addition, it downloads just the necessary files on demand, and it's customizable such that you can download them from a different location, in our case, Memcache. So now we're able to use our existing scalable Memcache infrastructure to house a lot of our source code and to satisfy much of the demand. But what about working offline? Like the whole point of distributed source control is to not have a server you have to depend on. And we admit that, and that's a problem. So what we've done is we have intelligent local caching. So we keep as much of the files necessary to allow you to do things like running log. Well, you have the change log, you have every commit. Log doesn't have to go to the server. Commits, we keep the necessary data for you to do a commit on any of your local branches. We keep the necessary data for you to check out between your local branches or to rebase between them. So if the server goes down, most user operations aren't affected. So it's almost all win. Performance-wise, it's pretty massive. Before, this one on the right, that's our clones, they were many minutes. I'm not actually allowed to say numbers, but they're many minutes, and now they're on the order of seconds. So it's 10 times faster. One week pulls, also 10 times faster. Month long pulls, 50 times. Year long, I can do it without getting coffee. It's pretty awesome. So pulls are a big win as well. The way we store data on disk has also changed because we're no longer using those file logs. We're able to do something a little more efficient. So other commands, such as rebase, get about a 30% increase. So all of these are pretty massive wins for our developers and for our infrastructure. In addition, disk space is massively reduced. We have 25, 25 times less disk space usage. This big circle on, on the right, that's how much we used to download. Now we only download the green stuff. Okay? So this is useful for developers because they have a smaller repo if it's better in their memory uh, in the file cache. It's useful for build infrastructure because now we're able to stick more repos on each build machine. And the repos are even small enough that we're able to stick them in memory a lot of the times. So this is a massive win for our build infrastructure and increases our capacity and our scalability. So this is pretty awesome too. Now, those were all client side benefits. There's server side benefits as well. So if your source control servers have an issue, this can help. In a normal setup, you have many clients. They're all talking to one generally central source control server. As that number of clients, that's your engineers, your automation, as that starts to get large, that source control server starts to have problems. There's capacity issues. And so what remote file log allows us to do is stick memcache in between. And so now most of your requests go to memcache, and that's much easier to scale. Um, and so that reduces the load on the server. And as we rolled it out, that big tip on the left, that's when we started, and on the right, it's when we ended, when we finished rolling out remote file log, it reduced our network load on our, uh, on our source control server by over 10x. So that means we're able to support 10 times as many engineers, 10 times as many build bots, 10 times as many simultaneous clones. Um, so it's a win almost across the board. So, a lot of advantages to remote file log. Um, like I said, you get much faster clones and pulls. You get a much more scalable server, much more scalable build machines. Only disadvantage that we're aware of is it's optimized for online, um, always online environments. So if you're in a corporation where you're all plugged into the wall, this is a great solution. If you're working in the Starbucks Wi-Fi or from many countries, less of a great solution. But you have to balance that for your own business needs. So. All three of these projects are open source and available. We have them on, in production on Linux servers. Uh, Watchman in particular is cross-platform and works on a bunch of platforms. HD Watchman and Remote File Log, we have them on Linux right now, but eventually they will be on OS X. Um, and if you have a distributed source control system right now and you, you have problems or foresee having problems, we encourage you to take a look at them. So I have time for questions, and also afterwards we'll be able to stick around and answer anything you might have. The question he asks is, what are the cache and validation strategies? Because the source control on our server is write-only, we don't need to invalidate. The, the version of that file will never change, because um, the key we use is key to the commit that had that file in it. So we don't have to invalidate cache, which is one nice thing. So the question is, when you first clone a repo, you have no file data. So how do you browse the repo? Well, the first thing you do after a clone, and the first thing Mercurial does, is it checks out the top commit the master commit. And that act of checking out says, all right, this commit says it needs these files. I'm going to go download those now. And so immediately it downloads from, from Memcache, and you can browse at your heart's content. And the thing to notice here is most developers don't notice that we did anything. The source control acts as if acts like they would expect it to. All the commands continue to work. So the question is, do we get to lose the subversion background back end after everyone's moved over? Yes, that's the goal. Why did we not just split our repository up? Why reinvent source control? And there's really a few reasons. Um, 
because we get a lot of benefits from having a big repository. We're able to make massive atomic changes to modernize our code base. For instance, uh, you might know we use hip hop, you know, a PHP variant. When we introduce new keywords, we're able to go across the entire code repository and put those in place immediately in one commit. Um, things like when uh, certain, um, if an API changes, a developer is able to change the API and change all the uses of it immediately in one commit. And we find that this is actually quite important for our ability to move fast and keep things going. So the question was, um, it sounded like the only reason we moved to Mercurial was the programming language. That's not actually the case. Uh, the data structures within Mercurial and within Git are very different. Git's is hard, it's like very strongly about this blob store and everything's a hash and everything's an object pointing to another object. Mercurial has slightly better data structures that allow us to, to use certain abstractions. So for instance, that file log and change log difference, those are completely different data structures with a particular APIs, and we're now able to replace the underlying implementations uh, more easily than we could with Git, because it's Python, because they have the extensibility points. So the question was, uh, working with Rebase and Mercurial is complex. Do we have any plans to smooth that out? Uh, I would like open source Mercurial to to be more open for the rebase flow. And they support it, and we use it. And actually, I think it's quite smooth. The big complication for people using Mercurial is the fact that it's not on by default and that they don't want to turn it on by default. Um, I don't think that's going to change much. But we've not actually had problems with the rebase flow. It, it's, we found it to be fairly smooth. And if you want to talk afterwards, we can figure out why, why we have perception difference. Thanks. Thank